Uh, I teach act, things related to theater and acting and voice and creating characters and things like that. I do it for the Walnut Street Theater. I do it for um, White Pines Productions out in Elks Park. I've done stuff for 1812 Productions, a bunch of other places in town. Just uh, Philadelphia Young Clarence, who's an organization you may or may not have run across as you've been going to school in the area. Um, I do shows, too. I just closed a show called Miss Alliance by George Bernard Shaw last weekend. I'm getting ready to start a rehearsing show next month called The Harry Eight by Eugene O'Neill. I was an acting apprentice at the Walnut Street Theater. I have my college degree in theater. I improvise with Comedy Sports Philadelphia in Center City. And they like their more short form comedic improvisation stuff like Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, stuff like uh, the director and writer Judd Apatow, like his type of style of like the way they write movies. A lot of improvisers come out of there. And the people you'd recognize from that are like Kristen Wake maybe and Melissa McCartney. Uh, what's the guy who's getting ready to play Ant-Man? Uh, Paul Rudd. Uh, all did lots of different comedic actors who helped create their own work. Maya Rudolph, all those type of people. So, what we're going to do today, and the reason I told you all of that, was that today our theme is for this workshop, uh, the title is Found Objects. Um, and we're going to work with objects both uh, visualizing objects that are common every day objects we've all seen in our lives, and also some physical objects later on at the end, to uh, improvise uh, stories and to communicate. Um, how do I want to start this as far as phrasing it? Oh, well, relating it to one book on Philadelphia, I guess I'll do that. The book is called Orphan Train. I don't know if any of you had a chance to read it. It's a good book. I mean, there's a reason why they chose it for one book on Philadelphia. But the characters in Orphan Train, uh, one of them, who, uh, the two main characters, one, Vivian, I think, uh, she has this uh, necklace that's an Irish cross necklace. It's like a circle with a cross in it. It's a, I can't remember the pronunciation. Do you know a Kalabala cloth cross or something like that? But she's separated from her family, and she, this is the one item she's able to hold on to from the time she loses her birth family to all the way to her elderly age. She has this one item, and it means a lot to her understanding that it almost gets taken away or sold a bunch of times. And the other main character, who's younger, president character, has a charm bracelet um, by her, given to her by her father, who's Native American. And each little charm represents something different related to her. There's a bear, a dolphin, something else that I can't remember right now. Maybe it's a raven, I think. Um, and during the course of the book, the younger character helps Vivian like organize her attic, which is full of stuff from her whole life. We all collect stuff, right? Even if we're young, even if we're poor, we somehow manage to collect a lot of things, a lot of junk, some of it more important than others. Some of it deceptively more important than other stuff. It's funny, like sometimes you'll be trying to clean out things or move or something, especially when you move. I don't know if any of you have had the chance to move from one house to another yet, or one place to another, or have to get rid of stuff. But you'll come across something like a pair of old shoes. And it'll be like, they'll be three years old, rusty, dusty, worn out, busted, dirty. And you'll remember what you did with those shoes. And you might like lose three or four minutes sitting there being like, oh, yeah, I want to track you with these shoes. Oh, I didn't make the basketball team in these shoes. Oh, my mom bought me these shoes. We didn't have a lot of money that month, but she bought me these shoes anyway. And every little insignificant thing you have, something randomly in your bag or purse, has a story behind it. It's connected to events in your life. And right now, it's like, I don't think about, I have, I have shoes and I wear them. <laughs> Some of you might think more or less about how important things are to you, but Everything has a little bit of a story to tell. So, I'm going to pull up, I just want to make sure that what I have here is good. I'm only going to use this computer once, just to have something in the background to help us. There it is, there I am. And this is what I want to pull up. And it's just going to be a guide to help us. Look at that. So, you can start to look at that. I'll actually ignore it for a second. <laughs> I just wanted to have it up and ready. Um, but if everyone who is wrong to participate could like put your stuff down, get a little bit comfortable, take off your coat, your jacket, 
whatever, and you think like it's going to constrain you or fall off, and come up here and stand in a circle with me. Uh, first exercise today is the invocation. The invocation comes from the world of improvisation. One of the modern founders, and when I say improvisation, I mean the type of performance that you're basically making up on the spot. There's no script. Um, improvisation, one of the founders, one of the developers of improvisation as we know it now, is a guy named Del Close, and this is one of the ways he came up with to open a show. So however many actors and improvisers you have, they line up, they get a suggestion of an object from the audience, and then uh, they start to invoke that object through these four steps. Del Close worked a lot with like old cultural things and ideas and civilizations um, to develop his ways for building up improvisational shows, both comedic and dramatic. And this comes from a cultural tradition of like invoking something or taking it into you, kind of like um, representing something to express it. So it works through these four phases. So we take an object. I'm just going to stick with shoes since I mentioned that earlier. Uh, and then the first phase is it is, I can, or I see. And everything you just, every, everyone who stands up here will just say, will just visualize a shoe in front of them. Any shoe, whatever specific shoe you see. And as a group, one at a time, you're going to say a complete phrase about that shoe, starting it with some combination of this. So for a shoe, it might be, I'm just facing out. I see leather. I see brown leather. I see buckles. I see straps. I see a tan heel. I see rock salt. I see smudges. I see a cracked sole. And I'll go on and on and on um, as a group. And notice the way what I was saying things. It's all objective. Me objective meaning like not personal. Like if we look at a shoe, like I'm thinking about my shoe. If we look at shoes, all things we can think about and just see on the shoe and then describe it. It's objective, descriptive, visual, mostly importantly, literal, and kind of clinical. Like if you just are looking at something, you just like describe everything about that thing that you can. All right. Um, and as far as like this goes, describing the different types of the object, it means like if I give you, I'm going to always give you a general object like shoe. And uh, you all will picture your own individual shoe in front of you and just describe what a shoe might be like. And then when the group feels ready, you're going to move on to you are or you. This, okay, so we're still on shoe. And this is, and just so you know, if this seems wacky and out there, it is. But, um, so, if I move on to you are or you, I will describe things such as you are the thing that protects my foot. You are so expensive. You are very loose now that I've worn you for two years. <laughs> you are no longer in style. You make my heels feel sore in the morning. So, it's subjective, meaning personal. It's how I personally feel about whatever I'm imagining in front of me. I can also describe its functions. I can also judge it. You no longer fit me well. You're no longer in style. You used to be beautiful. Things like this. All these things I feel about this shoe that I see. And then notice how I talk to it. With you are and you, it's just something talking to it as a person or a friend or a peer. Like some like as if it's a person in front of you. What does the object mean to you? Again, that goes back to it being personal. Thou art Thou. Then, so all of this, if you've ever seen, if you've ever been in your English and literature class and studied plot structure, everything is always moving up to a climax. This is really ramping it up. So now, I'm still just on a shoe, right? Okay. Um, thou art my transvance across the world. Thou art the holder of my understanding. Thou art my foundation. Thou art the craft of many years. Thou art the carrier of people and nations. 
See, it's gone up. And it's weird, because it should be. It's poetic. It's romantic. It's metaphorical. It's epic, legendary, mythic. How is how amazing is this object? What does it mean to the world? Um, elevated as if it's royalty or like a spiritual being. Thou art, thou art the leather possessor and holder of my body. Thou art the thing on which I stand and depend upon. Things like that. This is just with you. What does the object mean to society or history? Thou art the protector of all feet. Thou keep us out of the podiatrist's office. That sort of thing. The last level, the highest level, is the actual invocation. All this has been building to this. So, you speak through the shoot. You speak through the object. Here we go. So, it starts with, I am. All right. I am the protector of all feet. I am the craft and realization of a hundred years of development. I am stylish. I am warm. I am the carrier of your person. I am what you depend upon. I am what you put all your weight on. I am still in style. I can still get you across the city. I am shoe. So what I'm doing there. It becomes, again, you become the object, and it becomes egocentric. Ego meaning like it possesses a consciousness. I, I, godlike. It's amazing. It's important and like a king possessed, as in like you are now possessed of the object. You now speak as the object. You're channeling it. You're channeling it, exactly. Um, the object heard and remembers everything that was said before. So if you said that it was ugly, it was dirty, if it's out of style, if you're afraid of it, if you love it, it remembers all that. It said it remembers what you said about what it does to society, whether it's good or bad, it remembers all that. And you can use that here. The object has emotions and feelings too. So what happens is you go from step A, B, C, and D, and as a group you just go out and you say those phrases one at a time. And then when you feel like you've built up a little bit of energy and a little bit of momentum, speed, rhythm, someone will move on to you are. And then once you feel like you've done that for a little bit, someone will go on to thou art. And then you'll go into I am's. And then when you feel like you've really, really built up attention, like the best part of a song or like whatever, like a really, really like you get to the climax and you can't go any higher, someone will start I am whatever the object is. Okay? So that's how this literary, this is how this improvisational tool of the invocation works. Uh, improvisers use this to start a show. And everything you threw out, like all the phrases, all the things you thought to name and call things, like uh, you'll start to create scenes based on that. Now today, we're not going to go into doing scene work. But we're going to use these things to start to get, uh, dig into our own feelings, our own thoughts about things. And it's going to influence the next thing we're going to do as far as storytelling. But I'll get to that later. So this is hard. <laughs> and if you're not a performer or an improviser, it's very unusual. Even as an improviser, a lot of people don't always do this invocation. But here's the thing about improv. You can't really break it. And here's another thing about what we're doing here today. It's not school. <laughs> you're not going to get a grade. It's not science. It's not math. It's an art. And don't be afraid to do something wrong. I'm going to be over here helping to side coach. Side coach just meaning like regular coaching, like I'll gently be like, try this, try that. Don't step in each other's words, whatever. And it's just like we're just exploring something. That's all it is. So, there are four of you. If four of you could come up and we will try to do one of these, we'll just take like a rough draft at it. We'll take like a rough pass at it. will not be so performative in front of people. So um, with this group, I think it'd be best if we each took a chair and like...
beautifully uh, art decorated New Testament and Proverbs. Psalms and Proverbs was a, a chapters in, in the Old Testament or uh, verses that our parents had us to mem memorize certain ones when we were kids. Was, uh, uh, so I just continue to talk about this little book. Well, yeah, now that you've talked about it. You've already kind of started doing what I really want you to do, which is like, so just tell us a story or tell us something that's on your mind or some, whatever comes up from the, based on that object. And I think um, you've already kind of started. Oh, great, Dad. And, um, uh, gee, I remember the 23rd Psalm always. Um, and even my aunt had us to rewrote down, um, some, there's a verse in Proverbs that means a lot to encourage you if you're having difficulty. Uh, there's, there's a verse in Proverbs that, um, I don't know if I still remember it, but if I, you know, saw it, am I open, open this book? If you want to, yeah. Yeah, I would like to open it. It's part of um, it. Because, yeah, yeah, just, I like, um, I'm just going as far as to say that I really love this little New Testament, but I'm used to seeing it in orange. Mm. Orange with with gold writing in it, and um, and I've um, I've I've actually um, taken this book out in times of trouble um, or stress, mm -hmm. and um, and I did go to the to uh, the Psalm twenty third, the twenty third Psalm. This is just a very lovely. This is a very lovely book here. And this book comes in so many different sizes. Mm -hmm. What size did your did your mom have her own? Um, there was always if you go and they send you to Georgia to get something. There was one of these, and it was orange. It was like orange. Said, it, it was orange. And, um, Do you know where it came from? Um, no. Do you know if it was just your mom's or like the family's or? Uh, yeah. Well, well, yeah, my grandmother, um, there were always Bibles in every room with a house. Mm -hmm. But this small, no, normally no. It's this small, you, if you go in the drawer to get something, it would be in the drawer. And you said that like they used to have you like write things out? Like would you write it out multiple times? Yeah. And and we, actually, I remember us um, actually being in a family, not a circle, but a family group, and each one of us got a chance to recite one of the verses that we get memorized. And how did that make you feel, like having, like writing the things out, being in the group? Like, talk about that. Well, it made me feel empowered. Because, like, they, you know, be a grandmother being a very spiritual being and being in charge and leader of all of us younger folks. Uh, uh, it was just a... A, a book that if you if you trusted in this book and what this word said, you would do good in life. And how does that how does that apply to you now as the woman you are today? It, well, I think that it applies that she was right as far as encouragement, strength, guidance. Those are things. Th those are the, the attributes that you would get from a, a book of a, a, a New Testament. This is one of the more special ones. Okay. Well, thank you. You can hold on to that for okay. now. You can hold on to that for now. We're going to go for a new story. Thank you. Different issues and concerns. I'm finding I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities. Different mentalities. It, it, seems it seems hard. It seems challenging. It seems challenging. It's challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything else is.